everybody. All right, I'm so glad to have one of my good friends and comrades. He is um, just an amazing brother. We have uh, known each other at least, I, I guess, for about five or six years, I would say. And uh, he is um, uh, the director of the Christian Community Development Association. He's worked in full-time ministry in Latino and urban communities since 1982. He has served in youth ministry and church planting and advocacy and community development in San Francisco, San Jose, and Chicago. Uh, he was on the board of CCDA, which stands for Christian Community Development Association, uh, and uh, currently he serves as the CEO. He is the national chief executive officer of CCDA. Many of you may know of CCDA or have heard of CCDA. Some of us have gone to the CCDA meetings. How many of you have gone to CCDA meetings before? Wave your hand. Yep, we, a lot of us have gone. One of our own ministers, you may remember Sister Jaslyn, who's at Duke right now, Duke Divinity School, uh, has been one of the CCDA emerging leaders. And so we are a CCDA congregation. You may know that. Some of you tithe and offerings goes to help support CCDA. Did you know that? Amen. Now you know. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them now you know. Uh, uh, I have been able to be with uh, Noel in Washington, D.C. as well and have stood together in a number of different places. He served on uh, the Faith-Based Advisory Council, uh, uh, I think the first first one. So he was on the first one. I was on the third one. Amen. I, I wasn't important enough to be on the first one. So I was the third string. Amen. We did all the work that they left undone, I guess, huh? And um, has been a staunch advocate and wonderful um, just voice and visionary for making sure that we as the church have a heart for justice and that our congregations are meeting the needs of urban communities all across the country. Uh, part of their model is to actually make sure that we who have some affluence or at least upward mobility do not ascend out of our neighborhoods, but that we actually purposefully live in the neighborhoods uh, and, and be a light and a witness and a help and a healing and a source of strength. And their vision, CCDA, is very powerful. We had a great uh, time to hang out last night and uh, got a chance to eat and fellowship with Noel and Marianne, who is here, his wonderful, lovely, amazing wife. Y'all clap it up for her. They have three children and they live in Chicago. Uh, but certainly for today, uh, we are so blessed to have him here celebrating with us our 12 year uh, anniversary. And so I want you to stand to your feet, everyone, and put your hands together and let us welcome the spokesman for the King of Glory today. He is Brother Noel Castellanos. to be here with you all. I grew up most of my uh, adolescent years not too far uh, down the road in San Jose, Milpitas, and, uh, and then about almost 28 years ago, the Lord called my wife and I, we had two little children at that point, to move into a Mexican neighborhood in Chicago called Little Village. About a, you know Little Village? You lived in Little Village? Oh, okay, well, I'm going to have to tell the truth now. <laughs> Golly. See, you messed me up. <laughs> I had all these stories, and now I'm going to have to adjust them. Yeah, no. No, but it, it really is an honor. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not such a little village. It's 100,000 people, mostly of Mexican descent. So esta mañana vamos a hablar un poquito de español. ¿Está bien? Todo está bien, chévere. All right, you know, Stevie Wonder, yeah. I know, I know you at least had to know that, right? Just a little bit. Well, this morning, it is a pleasure to be here, and what a wonderful spirit is here, okay? I'm telling you, to have a, a, a room full of young people. Now, I was glad I met a couple of folks that are over 40, you know. Uh, I could tell because, you know, you had the same little gray hair that I have. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's really a miraculous thing when young people are excited about giving their life away and, and doing something. 
every neighborhood of our nation, okay, uh, it, it, we, we would be better off. We would, we would have a witness um, that would be shining bright for the glory of God. And so I, I want to, uh, if I'm going to give a name for my message this morning, it's uh, making great salsa in the hoods of our nation. All right, how many of you all like salsa? Okay, making great salsa in the hoods of our nation. And the subtitle I want to give it is Jesus' Recipe for Justicia. Jesus' Recipe for Justicia. Now, interesting, um, if you've ever looked at the King James Version of the Bible, how many of you still carry that big family King James right? I mean, most of us have gone to my, my Bible. Yeah, I, it's the same people with the gray hair, you know, man. But most of us have our Bible right here. And, and you can flip over to the King James if, if you want. But that was the Bible of choice for many, many years. And, and if you didn't read the King James, you just like were not really, I mean, you were kind of backsliding a little bit. Right? It wasn't really the word. But interesting thing about the King James translation of the Bible is in the entire translation, the word justice only appears about 20 times. Okay? So if you, were, uh, if you grew up on, on, on a diet of King James uh, Bible reading, it was very possible to conclude that God doesn't care that much about justice. It's just not that important because you don't find it anywhere. And so there's a, there's a little Hebrew word, hadek, that can be translated uh, in, in a few ways. And, and in Hebrew, uh, that word is a deep, has a lot of deep meaning, but any time that the translators of the King James Version came to that word, they had to make a decision. How do we translate this word? And they would translate it, instead of justice, they would translate it righteousness, okay? Now, there's nothing wrong with righteousness. But what happens is, if over and over again, a word that has a connotation that includes justice is only translated righteousness, what happens is you can grow up to become a Christian that thinks that the only thing that matters and the only thing that God cares about is you being pious and right with God this way. So you could be at church for five, six hours and you're righteous. You could be in your prayer closet for day after day after day and you're righteous. You never walk out the door to treat anybody with justice, but you do got righteousness. And, and everybody says, man, what a good Christian. Now... This is why I believe that if you, if you really want to understand a, a better translation and a better understanding of the fact that God cares about righteousness, but he also cares about justice, what you got to do is read the Bible in Spanish. Okay? Yeah, that's right. Because like in the Reina Valera translation, which is the equivalent of the King James in English, the word justicia appears almost 400 times. Okay, now, when you hear the word justicia, what does that sound like, even if you don't speak Spanish? Sounds like justice, right? Well, the reason is because like in Hebrew, in Spanish, there are not two words for righteousness and justice. There's only one word, and that, that word is justicia. So you read over and over again in places where we used to are used to hearing that, you know, we were counted as all righteousness before the Lord. Well, the reality is you might say that we were counted as all righteousness and justice before the Lord. That God cares about both. That, in fact, to try to divide the reality of being right with God and then uh, being right with our neighbor, especially those who are hurting, especially those who uh, can become the prey of the oppressor. It's impossible because justicia embraces both. So uh, I want to look at 
a, a, a recipe. There's six ingredients I want to talk to you about this morning that we find in the ministry of Jesus that I think are instructive when you think about the kind of church that we want to be, the kind of witness that we are called to be in the community. And it starts in Luke chapter 4, and uh, I'm going to actually walk you through just very, very uh, briefly the fifth chapter of Luke because there's a few incidents there that, that Jesus takes us through to give us a, a theology of transformation, okay? A, a theology, a recipe for justicia. How do we honor God by loving him and loving our neighbor at the same time? I think it, we're going to have a uh, scripture up here. Uh, it's out of Luke chapter 4, 18, and this is what it says. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. Now, this is a pivotal verse in the New Testament because after 30 years of living uh, in Galilee, in a little tiny pueblito called Nazareth, Nazareth, uh, Jesus, finally, at age 30, he begins his public ministry. He goes into the synagogue in his hometown. And this is uh, the occasion. You know the story. Uh, that morning, he's the one that stands up to read the text, which is common uh, in synagogue, just like in our church services. And this time when he reads, he's reading out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, but he does something very interesting. When he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me, he's not talking about somebody else. He's talking about himself. He's saying, if you want to know what God is like, if you want to know what God's uh, heart is, what his priorities are, what he's going to do, what, he, what he's coming to initiate, all you got to do is look at me. Now, uh, some of you all that uh, have grown up, you know, the church is not that old yet, 12 years old, but, you know, you were a little snotty-nosed kid when you started here, and, but now you just went away and graduated from college, and now you're back, and it's like, what? That, that little guy is, is, you know, is all that? And, and so Jesus kind of had to deal with a little bit of that uh, reality. I love the fact that in God's incredible wisdom, he comes and becomes human in a particular time and place that reveals a lot about who he is and his purposes, okay? Jesus, can I say it like this? He was born into a neighborhood that was considered to be the wrong side of the tracks. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Remember they said that about Jesus? They started hearing him teaching. They start, started thinking, man, this, is, this guy's talking like nobody else, and he's healing people. Can, but, but then they remembered, he's from Nazareth. There's no way that God could be working through him, there, especially not the idea that he could be the Savior. And, then it, and that was also true in his own hometown. Wait a minute. How is it that you're doing all these great things everywhere else? I don't see you healing anybody right here in your own church, right? And so there's a tremendous amount of turmoil, but what we find and what we cannot miss in this passage is that it is the place where Jesus initiates his public ministry. And, and he could have picked any verse in the Bible, but he goes to a jubilee passage in Isaiah 61, and if you know anything about Jubilee, it was God's intention for the people of Israel to model economic justice uh, among themselves so that every, uh, every 50 years that if somebody had gone into debt or had been thrown into prison or had lost their land, even if it was for a stupid reason, that God would say, man, you know what, all right, you learned your, 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 you know, you learned your lesson. Now we're going to give you back that land. We're going to give you back what you lost so you, you can start over again. And everybody experienced that kind of justice. Now, sadly, 
that practice was never fully implemented in, in, among the people of God. Can you imagine? The banks would be out of business. The loan sharks would be out of business, you know. I mean, it's like, wait a minute, we can't do that. I mean, that's, uh, you know, we, we kind of know that there is great profit by having the haves and the have-nots. And so we never saw that, but Jesus picks this passage that has economic and, and revolutionary kind of ideas and, and connotations, and he says, this is me. This is, this is the launching point for my mission to the entire world, okay? So, number one, the first ingredient that's got to be present if we're really going to be the kind of church that follows the way of Jesus, okay? Which I love the name, the way, because that's what Jesus calls us to. Number one is that we need to embrace the mission of Jesus as our own, okay? So simple, so simple. But I tell you, if every church in this country and around the world were to say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a Christ follower. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not just believe in God, not just sing to God, but I'm actually going to take on his priorities and his mission as my own. So that all of us would say, listen, it doesn't matter where I am, where I live, what my vocation is, the gifts and talents, the degree that you have, none of that matters because you are called to employ that on behalf of the mission of Jesus. We're to preach good news to the poor. We put the poor at the center of our love and concern because God puts the poor at the center of his love and concern. Can I say it like this? God puts the margins at the center of his kingdom priorities. So if we're going to really make a difference, we've got to embrace the mission of Jesus as our own. And this is what we find in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. But then you go on into chapter 5, and the second point, the second ingredient I think that's got to be uh, uh, present is that we need to enlist others to accomplish Jesus' mission of justicia. We've got to enlist others to accomplish Jesus' mission of justicia. Okay? Now, very first thing that happens in this little uh, kind of story that Luke lays out for us, and I, I don't think it was an accident the way he laid it out, because he's trying to teach us what it means to be on the way of Jesus. And the first thing he does is he goes and he finds Peter and his uh, brothers and, you know, his friends. And, and, uh, and he says, Peter, you know, I know you had a tough day at work today, but I'm the Lord of everything. I want you to, you know, go out there one more time and try to catch some fish. And, and you know the story. And, but what happens is Peter is confronted with the fact that this Jesus uh, he says, I need you. I want you to drop everything. I want you to drop everything and come follow me. Amen. Now, uh, after, uh, I, I wish I could say that, you know, that Peter recognized that he was sinful or that he recognized that, you know, he really needed God. But all he recognized and that we know for sure is that he had the power to, to uh, catch a lot of fish, right? <laughs> See, uh, I mean, let's be honest. Most of us come to God for selfish reasons. I mean, is, is it okay to say that? Is it okay to say? Most of us don't come to God because, oh, man, we're all broken up and we, no, no, no. You know, oh, you, you mean, God, I, I don't have to go to hell? You, you know, I don't have to suffer or there's all kind of, you know, or I can get a husband or a wife or I, maybe I'll become rich or whatever. But, but Peter uh, when he sees the power of God, he falls on his feet and he says, man, uh, I can't believe that you are asking me to follow you. I, I think that that humility is one of the great traits that uh, I hope we see in, in this next generation. That we just are marveling at the fact that God, the God of justice, of justicia, the God who cares about the poor, about the prisoner, about the lame, about economic justice, the God that envisions a world that is so different than what it looks like right now with the domination of sin and oppression. 
and he says, come on, uh, we, we've got to, I, I'm, I'm here to, embra- to uh, begin to enlist the team, and you're part of that team. Amen. You know, it doesn't matter how talented Pastor Mike or anybody in this world, my sister who, man, I, I want to just drop everything and come follow you in New York City, and, and you know, it's like, uh, but you know what, none of us can do anything alone. And that's why this, the, the expression of church is so important because what you're saying is we're the body. We're, 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 we got to do this together. All of us have a, a part to play. You all have a point of view and knowledge and wisdom and talent that nobody else has. And, and so, but God calls you not to employ that for your own personal gain, but to uh, accomplish the mission of Jesus uh, on the road to Justicia. Now, this passage is very famous. Uh, the one little sentence where Jesus tells Peter, you know what? Uh, you used to fish for men. From now on, you're going to be, I mean, for a fish. Now you're going to be a what? And what is he talking about in that passage? Discipleship. What's that? Witness evangelism. That's the, this is like the, the, one of the most, you know, primary texts for when somebody wants to tell you, you got to go out and tell people about Jesus. That's, I mean, in fact, there are many churches that think that's the only litmus test for whether a person is a believer or not. Are you going and tell people that, they're, that they are sinners and that uh, without God they're not going to have eternal life and uh, would you want to repent and turn your life around and say a prayer? And I would say that all of that, is part of our work. But what Jesus is doing, like you declare your mission and then the next thing you do is you say, I can't do it alone. We got to recruit a team to accomplish this mission. Okay? So, so God is not just calling us to be a mouthpiece, just to preach. He's calling us to be agents of justicia in this world where we show people what it means to love God and how to do justice Everywhere we go. Okay, so number one, we, uh, Jesus declares his mission statement. Number two, he begins to uh, recruit a team to help him accomplish that mission. And, and friends, a lot of people have said this, there's no plan B. It's the church. It's the church that is given that task. And now, we can't be so arrogant to say that, you know, uh, because God has called us, that we can't work with other people of faith or we can't work with the synagogue or we can't work with the police or we can't work with other institutions. No, but it means that we have this unique calling to embrace this mission. And in fact, if anybody in the community wants to see what it looks like to be a person of character and a person of caring, they look to us, they look to the church, okay? The third thing that we've got to do is that we've got to enter into the pain of our neighbors and our neighborhoods. We see Jesus walking along and a leper comes. And you know the leper, he he, kind of gets his courage up and he goes and comes and falls before Jesus and he says, if you want to, you can heal me. If you want to, you can make me whole. And I think so many people are convinced that the church uh, doesn't really want to enter into their pain. Wow. That we'd rather we criti- criticize the cause of their pain. We'd, re- we'd rather speculate about why they're in pain. We'd rather, you know, theorize and, and, and do all of that. But the idea that we just say, you know what? I, I see you, and, and, and I'm just going to be there for you and with you. Jesus, uh, he commits a miracle that, in that encounter. But I think in reality, there's two miracles that we see very plainly. Number one is that he heals him of his leprosy. Okay? He makes him clean. But the second thing he does is probably even more radical, is that he goes up and he touches him. He touches him. He, he doesn't do it from a distance. And I think one of the, one of the great tragedies that we have in, in the helping industry today is that we want to help people from a safe distance. And it's not possible. 
It's not possible. We can't help people from a safe distance. And think about the many, many people who have been down, being down so much that they, they don't even have the courage to step out of their reality to ask anybody else for help. So somebody's going to have to go to them. Okay? Uh, now, uh, this week has been a bad week for a lot of things, for health care, for sure, for immigration. Uh, there's a lot of talk right now that uh, through legal maneuverings, that judges are going to rise up a legal confrontation to President Obama's uh, his uh, uh, DACA program, where he helped almost a million young dreamers that came into this country as little kids. They were brought here by their parents. They don't know anything about Mexico. They don't know anything about anywhere else. They're they're you know they're from this country. And they just so happen to be bilingual. They just so happen to be bicultural because they don't believe that you've got to get rid of one thing to embrace another. Yeah. Right? right. Uh, and, and, but these young people, right, uh, many of them have been driven to the, uh, to the shadows. They've been driven to hide, to not come out. And, and yet, even with the threat on their lives, it's the dreamers that have been some of the greatest advocates for changing our broken immigration system in our nation. Risking their well-being, knowing that they, they might de be deported. And I love, I love what's going on in communities, immigrant communities all over our country because I go to a, 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 a one of our ministries in Phoenix and they're having youth night. So they said, come on and check out youth night. Well, you know, a lot of times when you go to a church to have youth night, you're playing basketball or foosball. I go into a room, and there's about 25 young Latino dreamers. You know what they're doing? Voter registration. They're on their computers calling, making calls. Man, you got to vote, uh, you know, no on this, and here's the candidate that uh, is good on immigration. And I'm thinking, this is youth night? I mean, you know, so what do you all do for fun? <clears throat> you know, let's go lock ourselves up somewhere. You know, let's go get arrested, you know. Uh, but it's serious. It's serious. We've got to enter into the pain of the people in our community if there's going to be any healing. That's the way Jesus heals. Nobody wants to be a welfare number. Nobody wants to be a recipient of, of somebody's charity. We don't want to uh, feel like a client. If you walk in through the doors of the church and, and somebody says, you know, we got, we got a client here to see the pastor, you better go find another church. I'm sorry. Because the reality is that what Jesus is trying to do is take people that have been excluded and bring them into a familia, into a family. And, 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 you know, I don't know about your family, but we hug, we, you know, that's what, what you all are doing. You touch, you know, but, and you do it appropriately now, okay, all right? So, but we, uh, our, our founder, John Perkins, who lived through all of the racial uh, kind of uh, dynamics in the South in the 50s, he says that a real leader, is a person who enters into the pain and suffering of the people of their time. And so, friends, because uh, sin reigns in this world until Jesus comes to make everything new, we're always going to have an opportunity and a choice. Are we going to, uh, are we going to uh, pursue uh, assessing power so that we can confront injustice by beating somebody over the head? Or are we going to embrace the folks that are in pain and say, we're going to stand with you as we work to change the system, yeah. as we work to bring about justice for all? So, number one, we embrace the mission of Jesus as our own. Two, we enlist others to accomplish that mission. Number three, we enter into the pain of our neighbors in our neighborhood. And then uh, next ingredient is that we exercise bold faith to address the holistic needs of people, okay? The very next story that we find in this chapter 5 is Jesus encounters, a, uh, he goes into a town, and he uh, enters a home, and he begins to preach and heal, 
And before you know it, all of the muckety mucks and the VIPs fill up the house so that there's no more room in the place. Yeah. Okay? Now, uh, and so, uh, you know, everywhere that Jesus went, the word was getting out about him. And, but, but it wasn't just people that wanted to come to get healed. There was also all these religious leaders that were getting concerned. Yeah. They were getting concerned. And so this day, while that meeting's about to take place, you start uh, realizing that some, something's going on. So there was a man, young man that had been uh, laying by the side of the road uh, on, on a pallet because he was paralyzed. Sounds like he never had walked before. We don't know for sure. And we don't know it exactly that it's young people, but it's got to be somebody under 40 because I know Michael couldn't do some of the things we're going to see happen in this story, okay? But these young men, <clears throat> they see their friend that's laying on that pallet, and they say, look, uh, why don't we take him over to Jesus? He's not far away. Let's take him to the house, and let's see if we can get him healed. This boy hadn't walked ever. We got to get him to, you know, get healed up. Yeah. And so they take him. When they get there, the house is full. There's no getting in. And if it was a bunch of, uh, you know, older uh, friends, they'd say, shucks and hickey dern, let's go home. You know, I mean, we got to just, you know, we tried. Sorry, Pablo. Sorry, Holmes. You know, uh, hey, we can't get in. Maybe he'll be back. You know, maybe he'll be back. And, uh, you know, we'll see what we can do. But no, one of the friends uh, says, wait a minute. There's got to be something we can do. And so they came up with this crazy idea. And, you know, you know the story. They, they jump up on the roof and they lower this paralytic man right in front of Jesus, and everybody's kind of watching, you know, what's happening. And, uh, and then Jesus uh, does some amazing things. First of all, he looks at those four guys and say, wow, what faith. You know, he, he, he's kind of commending the faith of these four. And, you know, I don't know how much deep faith they have. I don't know that they've ever been to seminary or, you know, <laughs> there's nothing that says that continue to do what you're doing here at The Way. Man, it's going to take that crazy action. Don't, you know, we're not going to give up if one strategy doesn't work. We're going to, you know, and uh, a friend of mine in Detroit preached this sermon on this, and, and he, I think it, it, I got to repeat it. He says, in that little story, there's, the, there's a paralyzed guy, and then you got the four folks. One of them on the end, uh, he was the innovator, right? He said, oh, man, look, here's what we do. We go on the roof, tear it off. So we need to have some of you step up and use your innovator gifts, right? So you're the one that's always going to be pushing and pushing to do something crazier, and, and we got to listen because the innovators are the ones that are going to lead us in that way. And then second person on the pallet was the implementer. Implementers without, uh, that, that, you know, or innovators without implementers are not going to get anything done. All they do is sit around thinking of all these great ideas, but until the implementer gets involved and says, all right, here's what we're going to do, then nothing happens. Now, that doesn't happen here at this church. All right, all right. I'm not talking about here. All right. And then third is the other uh, end of the pallet is the intercessors. Amen. Friends, this is a spiritual battle that we're embarking on. We, we got to have everybody has got to be involved. You may be, you know, past the age where you're going to climb up on that ladder and do all that, but you're going to pray. You're going to teach us that there's nothing more important than uh, making this about the kingdom of God. Amen. And then finally, the last uh, pallet uh, corner is the investor, the investor. This is the guy that looks up and says, okay, man, you just done wrecked that roof. We got to pay for it somehow. All right, so let's got you know we got to. This is how much we're going to have to pay, and and so we need some people that make some money. We need some people who know how to go and and, and bring that resource, not just money, people resource, uh, all the knowledge, the technology to come and say if we're going to do this innovative stuff, we're going to have to really figure out how to pay for it as well. So exercise bold faith to address the holistic needs of. People. The next uh, story that you find is Levi. Remember Levi, the tax collector? Yeah. 
He throws a party. All his friends come. And, you know, frankly, it, it wasn't a church-going crowd. Okay? It was like, wait a minute. What? And then, for some reason, these religious leaders keep showing up. And Jesus feels cool. I mean, he's having a great time, but the religious folks are saying, what the heck is going on? Him and his disciples, they're always around these, these really sinful, bad people. Don't they know this tax collector is a crook and all this stuff? You know, and, and it takes one to know one. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, they're just kind of, but, 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 and then, and then Jesus says this. In the middle of all that, he says, it is not those who think they are well that need a doctor, but those that know they're sick. That's who I've come for, okay? You know, I've come to realize, and Jesus makes this very plain, when you put the poor at the center of your concern, when you begin to say those folks that are marginalized economically, who've been locked out, who have been kept out, who, who, who aren't integrated into our systems, into our churches, into our structures, into our society. Do you know that when you begin to work on their behalf, you've got to anticipate and expect that there's going to be criticism. You're going to be criticized. Because, friends, you're messing with the status quo. And, uh, you know, I am a little older than, than Pastor Mike. I'm, I'm, I'm like almost 60, you know. And, and, you know, for many of us that are in this religious work, my age, we have too much to lose to stir up too much trouble. We got organizations to run. We got money to raise from donors. We got this respectability thing that we think we have. And, and you know what? Uh, it's going to take a, a young bold faith now those of us that are a little older we can exercise that kind of faith but we're going to have to be aware of our potential danger points friends when we begin to do the work of justicia uh, folks are not going to be excited about it all the time because you know why are you always complaining why are you always bringing this thing up? Why are we talking about this? Have you ever heard, uh, you know, a, a, a white person say, how come we're still talking about that all these years later? I, you know, and, you know, hey, Mexicans do the same thing, you know. And, and which, which brings me to the point where I really am convinced that Jesus was part Mexican. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know where this fits in, Michael, but I'm going to go just go ahead and interject it. <clears throat> Number one, his name was Jesus. <laughs> and then number two, his mama's name was Maria. Maria. <laughs> number three, his dad's name was Jose. Jose. <laughs> but the clincher is Jesus worked in construction. <laughs> All right, all right. We will land. We're gonna. We're, we're done. I think. I think we're out of uh, uh, out of tape for the, you know. So number one, we take the mission of Jesus and we make it our own. We enlist others to accomplish that mission of justicia. We enter into the pain of our neighbors in our neighborhoods. We exercise bold faith to address the holistic needs of people, and then uh, we endure uh, criticism for ministering to those on the margins. And then finally, we embrace structural and systemic change, okay? The very last story that Jesus tells in this chapter, and, I, and I, this is why I believe Luke had something in mind, because he's just showing these young disciples, look, there's a cost to being on the way of Jesus. See, the way of the world is wide. And you can go and do everything. You can do whatever you want because so, there's so much room, so much freedom, so much latitude. You, can, you don't have to hang out with anybody. You don't got to mess with anybody's problems. You can just do whatever you want. That's the way that leads to where? Destruction. But the narrow way that leads to life, guess what? That's the way of Jesus. And on this road, on this way, it's about justicia. 
You can't just talk about loving God. You've got to talk about loving your neighbor. And on that narrow road, your neighbor is right next to you because it's narrow. You can't avoid people who are different than you. You can't avoid people who speak different languages. You can't avoid people who are maybe politically at a different place than you are. We have to be together on that narrow road. And if you're willing to be on that narrow road regardless of where you started, you're welcome in God's kingdom. Okay? You're an ally because we're walking on that narrow road together. But the last thing Jesus says to this group of followers, it's almost like I could see him bringing them together and says, okay, now we're going to do the last session. We're going to do the last session. And he says, you know what? When you sew a cloth, that's been torn, you don't take a new piece of cloth that's, that's never, that just got woven and that's never been washed and that, you know, it, it, when you wash it, it's going to shrink. You don't put that patch on an old piece of clothing because it's going to tear. And, and you don't get it, do you? You're not, you're not hearing me, are you? And then he said, well, let me, let me give you an example that I know you're going to get. He says, all right, you don't put new wine into old wineskins. Because if you do that old wineskin that is fixed, that is rigid, that is hard, that has a lot to lose, that is comfortable, when you pour new wine in that old wineskin, it's going to burst. So what you got to do is you got to put new wine into a new wineskin. You, get, you understand where I'm going? You understand what I'm talking about? I believe Jesus is trying to make it really plain that, listen, if you're going to make justicia the priority of your way, the old structures won't contain it. The old institutions won't contain it. You're going to need new structures, new institutions. And then... Here's something that I think we've got to really, really pay attention to. That before we can challenge the structures and institutions of the world to be more just, that we've got to do that within the church itself. Okay? What are we, are we able to contain the new wine that God is pouring out? that doesn't have this division between righteousness and justice, between the social gospel and the proclamation gospel, okay? Before, you know, uh, caring about the earth or caring about heaven, it's about justicia. And so then Jesus says this. He says, you know what's going to happen? When, when, when you begin to make this change, the people will say, we prefer the old wineskin better. Okay, isn't that, isn't that crazy how we are that way? We know that God wants to do something new, but we would prefer to stay stuck in our old way so that we are comfortable because maybe we have too much to lose yeah. than to see God do something absolutely new. Well, friends, I believe that God is doing something new. This recipe for uh, being people of justicia, is not, it's not complicated. It, it's simple. But oftentimes we leave out these ingredients. And we don't get the, uh, we don't attract people with the flavor of the kingdom the way we can. When I was uh, pastoring years ago in my neighborhood, one Christmas we, we had a potluck. Like, you know, you always got to have potlucks. And, uh, and so I decided I'm going to make some salsa. So I made this really, I said, you know, I'm not going to make the normal salsa. I'm going to make a holiday salsa. And so I, I found a recipe and put all kinds of, you know, stuff in there. And, and, and it had pineapple. And it had nuts. And it had, uh, you know, cranberries and all this stuff and some jalapenos. And I took that salsa to church and nobody touched it. <laughs> and everybody's kind of looking at it. Pastor made it. Pastor, you know. Pastor lo, lo trajo. And finally, this guy who was one of the very first men that came to Christ when I was pastoring, 
you know, he, he had really suffered with alcoholism and he became my good friend. And Manuel came and put his arm around me. He said, Pastor, no puedes hacer salsa sin los tomates. You can't make real salsa without the tomatoes. <laughs> and I, I'm here to tell you this morning that the way, that the way church, that without the six ingredients that we find in Jesus' recipe for justicia, we're not going to make authentic salsa that will bring about change in our world. God bless you. Yes. Let's stand, everyone. Why don't you just take a few moments and stand and let's invite the Spirit of God to help us to respond. Thank mm-hmm. you.